The 16th century was a period of transition for Europe. The Renaissance was bringing Europe from the Middle Ages into the modern era. And at the beginning of the century, the two greatest powers on the European continent were France and the Holy Roman Empire. England was clearly still a second-tier state, and yet it was being courted by both. England and France had traditionally been rivals, but in 1520 they attempted to improve relations through a dramatic display of wealth and politics. That is, they both tried to impress each other by throwing one of the greatest parties in history. There was so much gaudy wealth on display that the entire meeting became known as the Field of the Cloth of Gold. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Despite periods of defeat, when the Hundred Years' War ended in 1453, France had defeated the English claim to the throne and pushed England completely off the continent, or at least almost. What remained was the tiny Pale of Calais, which England had first seized in 1346 after the Battle of Cressy. Calais remained a bastion from which the English could attempt to make gains on the continent. The French and English had been at war as recently as 1514 in the War of the Holy League in Italy. Meanwhile, France had an even greater rival on the continent in the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs had pursued political gains by marriage, which slowly put more and more of Europe under the rule of a single family. In 1440, a Habsburg, Frederick III, had become Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and under Frederick's son, Emperor Maximilian I, the empire expanded greatly. His son, Philip, married the Queen of Castile and Aragon, and his grandson, Charles I, would bring Spain into the Habsburg Empire. France found itself surrounded on three sides by Habsburg-controlled lands in Spain, Germany, and the Netherlands. Another threat lay on Europe's doorstep as well, the encroaching power of the Ottoman Empire. In England, Thomas Wolsey was Henry VIII's almoner, a religious officer in charge of distributing alms. He quickly became influential within the English court, becoming the primary figure in all affairs of state. He became known as the Alter Rex, or Other King. Pope Leo X saw the threat of the Muslim Ottomans as an existential threat to Christendom. He made Wolsey a papal legate, a personal representative of the Pope, in 1518 and trusted him to negotiate a Europe-wide peace. Wolsey, at the height of his influence, successfully organized a massive peace conference between 20 leading nations of Europe, including Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, England, and France, along with lesser powers like Denmark, Portugal, and the Dukes of Gelders and Urbino. The resulting Treaty of London was an early non-aggression pact. It meant to halt war between Christian nations forever, a lofty goal for countries constantly engaged in one war or another. The powers entered into a defensive league that would discourage war between members by having the entire alliance turn against the aggressor. With their borders and peace secure, Pope Leo hoped that Europe could properly turn against the Ottomans. Wolsey's success in the treaty had another impact, effectively making England the third power in European affairs, though still well behind France and the Holy Roman Empire. France and England had a separate agreement as well, betrothing their infant children together and promising to meet to secure their perpetual friendship. The meeting had initially been planned for 1519, but the death of Emperor Maximilian necessitated an imperial election. The primary contestants were Francis and Charles I, Henry VIII also presented himself as a candidate. All three were young leaders, in their twenties, and ambitious. Francis and Charles paid huge sums to bribe the electors, but ultimately Charles was elected unanimously. Conflict between the two seemed inevitable. Francis, for instance, had captured Milan, which Charles demanded returned as part of imperial holdings. Both powers sought the support of England. By March of 1520, Thomas Wolsey had been empowered to plan the meeting between England and France, to take place at the end of May. Complicating the meeting was Charles, who sailed by England on his way to Germany from Spain. Henry delayed leaving for France until he could meet the Emperor between May 26th and 30th. Suspicion on all sides of what alliances were being planned abounded. Planning continued, despite accusations, and a site was chosen between English Guine and French Ard. The site was around halfway between the two castles, although it sat in English territory. The valley where the meeting itself would take place was carefully landscaped, so each side would have platforms of equal height. Seeking equality, the kings were to dine with each other's wives and offer priority to the other when they visited. The meeting was a chance for both sides to display their wealth and power to all of Europe. Both sides were forced to rebuild the worn-down castles between the meeting site, and both kingdoms hoped to outdo each other in the construction of temporary buildings. 
most obvious was the use of cloth of gold, which is a fabric that uses threads wrapped with high-content gold. The French preferred tents and pavilions, while the English planned an enormous false palace. The French tents were made of canvas and then covered with cloth of gold, silver, velvet, and satin. Thousands of ribbons and hundreds of yards of canvas were procured, along with dyes, cloths in the king's colors, and heraldic devices, fleur-de-lis, and more. King Francis's main tent stood as high as the tallest tower and 60 paces high, according to witnesses. It was covered in cloth of gold and blue velvet, along with gold fleur-de-lis. A life-size wooden statue of St. Michael, the patron saint of France, stood inside. Each and every piece was thick with metaphor and allegory that would have been clear to a medieval audience. Dozens of smaller pavilions and tents surrounded the king's tent and banquet pavilion. Unfortunately, bad storms would tear down many of the French tents only a few days into the meeting. The English palace was 12,000 square yards. An eight-foot-tall base of brickwork was built with 30-foot wooden walls. The walls were covered with cloth and canvas and painted to look like bricks. Large glass windows peppered all the walls, including the interior. 4,000 feet of glass was brought in. One witness said the glass was the most beautiful he had ever seen, and it gave visitors the impression that they stood in the open air. The canvas roof was curiously painted to look like slate. Timber was so scarce in the immediate region that it was floated in from Holland, without any ship, as the timber was too long to be put on the ship directly. The palace had four large sections and a central courtyard and was surrounded by a moat. Some 2,800 tents were also erected for the less distinguished. As many as 3,000 English laborers arrived to build the palace and repair the castle. Two gilt fountains sat inside, one with God of Wine Bacchus pouring out the wine. Actual wine, red and white claret, while the other had a statue of Cupid. Like the French pavilions, the English palace was heavily decorated with a focus on the allegory and pageantry of the occasion, such as statues of princes, Hercules and Alexander the Great. The palace held offices, pantries, and a cellar with 3,000 butts of wine. There were also large chambers for the king, queen, Wolsey, and others. Both French and English courts had impressive banqueting halls built as well. Wolsey's lodgings were perhaps even finer than Henry's. The palace was grand beyond measure, with one contemporary writing that it could occupy the attention of the least excitable man for days. Of particular note were two monkeys that Henry had received from the Turks, he had them gold-encrusted with gold leaf, and Francis was overcome with much curiosity playing with those little knaves, who nonetheless caused endless hijinks. An enormous number of people came to the event, and detailed lists were made up. Henry brought 114 nobles, the Archbishop of Canterbury, two dukes, five bishops, 20 barons, 70 knights, 12 chaplains, 200 guards, and more. His retinue alone was 3,997 people and over 2,000 horses. The Queen had a more modest retinue of only 1,175 people and 778 horses. Even Wolsey, a poor man of the cloth, had 238 servants and 150 horses, and more likely attended than survive on the lists. A French list doesn't survive that was likely similar. Nearly everyone of importance in either country attended, including possibly Anne Boleyn, 19 years old and then in Paris. Negotiations were conducted most solely by Wolsey. His power in England was added to by large pension from Francis. Wolsey was said to be tickled by vain glory. More than anything, the success and grandiosity of the meeting was his own personal triumph. One writer said that Wolsey longed like a peacock to display his many-colored tail. Francis arrived on May 31st, but Henry pleaded for more time and didn't arrive until June 4th. Wolsey was sent ahead and arrived with a large retinue, with gentlemen in velvet and carrying gold maces. He himself rode a mule decked out in gold. Before Henry arrived, Wolsey negotiated the personal meetings, set for June 7th. The two kings came together that day, a feast of Corpus Christi in a specifically prepared veil. A tent of cloth of gold stood at its center, with Turkish carpet and two chairs with crimson cushions. Nobles, priests, and soldiers accompanied both men, as well as countless musicians. They arranged their leaving by firing cannons so that each party could leave at the same time. Italians who witnessed the event largely thought that the French party was the more impressive. Distrust still abounded. Both sides were certain that the other had more men than was promised, and Italian accounts say thousands of soldiers from both were within call. Both sides inspected the other's soldiers to make sure that they were unarmed. One chronicler says that Francis even dismounted and wouldn't have gone on except that a French lord reassured the king. The English too paused when a report arrived that the French were twice as numerous as the English. But the Earl of Shrewsbury assured Henry that the French were more afraid of him than he was of them, and the English party marched on. 
Spectacle was certainly involved, and both men dressed to impress. A French account described Francis's outfit. The king wore a cap of black velvet with feathers of the same color and some large jewels in it, very well set, which the king estimates at 2,000 ducats. His doublet was embroidered with gold knots, the shirt protruding from the slashes, the tags of which were most beautiful jewels. While an English account said of Henry, the king of England wore a very handsome and costly doublet of cloth of silver with a girdle and apron of sabara from the cincture to the shoulder, of cloth of gold studded with very beautiful jewels, and a black velvet cap with jewels and black feathers. When the parties arrived, each stood at opposite ends of the valley atop the mounds, which had been built at equal heights. English trumpets brayed, and the French responded, and the kings went on with only a small party. They rode a short distance to a spear which marked the actual meeting place, and the kings stopped two bowls throw apart. They embraced twice, first on horseback and then on the ground. What the kings said to each other isn't known, though it's been variously imagined. They met for between thirty minutes and two hours, apparently leaving Wolsey impatient as the day grew dark, but finally parted. Banquets, jousts, feasting, and feats of arms abounded in the days that followed. Feats of arms included individual combat on horseback and foot, as well as the tournament or group combat. The tournament often had a dramatic and imaginary theme, and one man would challenge all the others while weaving a story about defending a shepherdess or relating classical mythology. The 16th century tournament was a blunted affair compared to earlier melees. Weapons were generally dulled, and even in jousting, the risk of serious injury was minimized. It was more about entertainment and showmanship than actual killing, to pass the time from idleness. An account of the tournament called it a silken war. A huge elm tree was built in the center of the chosen field, estimated to be 34 feet high, 129 feet in circumference, and 43 feet in span. Two other artificial trees entwined with it, a hawthorn from England and a raspberry from France. The feats began on June 9th, with several hundred men participating. The knights wore elaborate and heavily symbolic and allegorical armor and costumes, usually two a day. An example of the heavy metaphor is given by the chronicler Edward Hall. Francis's costumes told a story throughout the various days by color and dress. On the first day, Francis's horse wore purple satin pierced with gold and embroidered with black raven's feathers. According to a chronicle, the term corban, French for raven, had the meaning of cor, meaning heart. While the term for tail feathers signified pain, while buckles stood for truthfulness so that the entire ensemble stood for heart fastened in pain endless. Henry, meanwhile, wore 2,000 ounces of gold and 1,100 pearls. According to a French account, at some point during the festivities, Henry challenged Francis to a wrestling match. Wolsey had been careful not to place the two kings in direct competition, fearing what it might do to relations. According to the source, Francis promptly gave Henry a tour de bachagne and tossed Henry to the ground easily. A French historian blamed the falling out between the two countries on the humiliating defeat and Francis's inability to be diplomatic. Henry, however, bested Francis easily in the archery competition. Combat on foot, largely a farce, was ended in partnership. There was a good fight and pastime on both parties. When they weren't performing feats of arms, the kings, lords, and ladies were eating and dancing. As with everything else, the volume and quality of food was remarkable. Forty-nine tons of ale were brought by the English, as well as twenty tons of beer, quite apart from the huge amount of wine. A ton was a liquid measure representing roughly 252 U.S. gallons, or 954 liters. They did mummery, where groups dressed in costume and mimed a scene, and masks, where members would dance and mask with strangers before unmasking themselves at the end, usually with large movable set pieces and allegorical connections to other parts of the entertainment. They also held a large mass for the entire group. This was before England broke away from the church. Wolsey himself gave the benediction. On June 24th, the meeting broke up. The cost of the extravaganza is difficult to measure. Both sides would resell or reuse much of the fabric, but the overall cost was still enormous, even accounting for that. Francis likely spent as much as an eighth of France's annual budget, while Henry spent more than his whole household's yearly expenditure and more than a third of England's entire annual income. It's difficult to translate that into modern numbers, but the display cost easily tens of millions of dollars, and the idea of a similar event today could cost considerably more. Yet despite all the pomp and all the expense, very little was accomplished. The only diplomatic success was to revise the marriage agreement between the king's young children, Henry's four-year-old daughter Mary and Francis's two-year-old son Francis, and that marriage ended up never occurring. In fact, relations between the two countries weren't really improved. Shortly thereafter, Francis became strengthening the fortifications at the castle in which he'd stayed in anticipation of another war. 
And hanging over it all was the clearly coming war between France and the Holy Roman Empire, and Wolsey negotiated an alliance between England and the Empire in the secret 1521 Treaty of Bruges. By the end of 1521, Europe was at war again, with the Habsburgs, England, and the Papal States fighting France and the Republic of Venice in what was called the Italian War. So despite the, the, the hundreds of miles of gold-embroidered cloth and more than 12,000 gallons of ale, Europe in 1521 really looked hardly different than it did be, before the Treaty of London in 1518. And yet the field of the cloth of gold, which is a good example of the complex relationships and the diplomacy and the spectacle of early modern Europe, did accomplish one thing. The website Party Bowl lists the field of the cloth of gold as the greatest party in history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.